Uh, okay. Good morning or good afternoon. I'm uh, David Hines, uh, as uh, JC introduced me. Uh, I've been the benefit manager here at the school board in Nashville for about, it'll be nine years in September. I have a background where I've been both public and private. I'm an old claims management guy that came out of the Blue Cross system that went to uh, work for his customer once upon a time, uh, which was the state of Tennessee. So I actually left from the uh, claims payer side and actually to the uh, uh, to the uh, the other side of the table and actually managing the benefits from the employer perspective uh, many years ago. Uh, since then, I've been both public side and private and uh, truly enjoy and have a passion for what I do. Uh, who I represent today is Metro Nashville Public Schools. And uh, folks, when you think about Nashville, a lot of people just think about country music, but we are a very diverse urban school system. In fact, we're one of the fastest growing areas in, in the country and becoming more diverse by the minute, it seems. Uh, only in Nashville, uh, along with Central Music, you'll find the largest Kurdish population within the United States. And so we are extremely diverse and getting more diverse all the time. Uh, our school system, when we talk about 140 work locations, about over 526 square miles, basically we're talking about school sites elementary school, middle schools, high schools. And uh, here later on we're going to talk about school clusters and that's how we basically do some bundling as we can think about uh, trying to understand all the feeder cells that kind of go into the high school as you talk about the elementary schools and the middle schools and how they feed into the high school and what the, the final outcome uh, comes out there at the end which is that child that graduates and, and their ability to succeed in life. As you can see, we have a relatively good-sized budget with about almost 189, almost $200 million attributed to health care costs and disability. When I talk today, I'm going to be focusing primarily on the teacher's health plan. Uh, what we have is a, a bit of an oddity within the school system, uh, which if you're in government, you're probably very familiar with oddities. But due to the uh, wisdom of the people that set up Metro government many years ago, they put a dividing line uh, when it came to benefits. They said that everybody that receives a teacher's pension uh, will be basically separate from everybody that does not. And so within our school system, we have 9,200 active and retired teachers that are managed independently from the rest of Met Nashville Metro government employees, support staff being part of that. I'm considered support staff. And for the first time in my career, I'm actually on a benefit plan that I do not manage, which is a little bit strange for me as well. You know, one of the things we, we look at, you know, as benefit people is trying to figure out how we tie into the, the overall equation. You know, when I look at what is the vision of a school system, you know, we're not producing cars. I used to be at Nissan once upon a time. You knew what you were producing, you knew the materials that you had coming in, and you knew what you were supposed to have on the far side going out. Uh, we produce kids, educated children, uh, and, and, and what we say to succeed, we have to provide an excellent teacher in every class for every child every year. And I say that's where we kind of tie in in the benefits area. Uh, we don't select them. Uh, we don't train them. Uh, but we have a part when we talk about the excellence when it comes into health and trying to understand the correlation of health and academic outcomes is what we've been focusing in on. One of the easy tie-ins, it seems to be, as you talk about excellence, is that excellence of the, the teacher needs to be in the classroom. There are different studies that we look at that say that basically there's significant reductions in student achievement if a teacher is out of the classroom for over 10 days in a year, and people will debate back and forth and merit on that, but you would just think about the common sense of the equation that basically, what did you do when you were a kid when a substitute was in, in the classroom instead of your teacher? I know with myself, my main job was basically to harass that substitute teacher at that point. It sure wasn't focused anywhere near the academics that, it, that it, you're supposed to be or, or usually are uh, when the teacher's in the classroom. You know, in teaching and academics, we've got a real issue with attendance. Uh, you know, our teachers are given 10 sick days a year. On average, they use 10 sick days a year. But that's on average. We have some that use less and some that use more. But we're trying to 
approach this issue of what can we do to impact the health that will actually provide the, te the teacher in the class, but also look at the other things that may also impact health in the way of presenteeism and some of the impact on education. And we've got some interesting correlations. To get to where we are today, we started many years ago. I started in 2006 at the school board. I guess it's not that many, but it seems like it all the time. Uh, when I came to the school board, I, I went to my insurance trust, and I wanted to make sure that we were all singing off the same page as we went to move forward. And so one of the first things I looked to accomplish with them is basically set up an agreement on how we're supposed to approach our, our benefits and benefits management. And that's where we, I went to them to establish this mission that, that involved looking beyond health care costs alone to the impact of poor health and, and basically look at the whole health and productivity paradigm. To that end, we wanted to basically turn the corner and get more involved in the administration of care, not just the paying for health care, uh, because I've had some experience with on-site medical at other places. found it to be a very positive effect on the community and, and enjoy this whole aspect of actually being able to get on the positive side of actually providing the care and seeing people's health approved instead of just dealing with paying the bills and concerned about the cost. Uh, we took a very aggressive approach to our on-site medical clinics. Uh, we started working on it back in 2006. We ran into some opposition from uh, some of the uh, administrators within the larger Nashville metro government. But in 2009, we were able to move forward, and we opened up five on-site medical clinics. Now, these clinics aren't large bricks-and-mortar structures. We actually took classroom portables and remodeled them. Uh, in one of these classroom portables, which is basically a modular home or a mobile home type situation, uh, we used our own internal architect, uh, did a restructuring. We could move, we put four exam rooms, uh, some very small waiting room, uh, an office area, a nice size handicap restroom, and a lab in there to make a fully functioning primary care clinic. We used classroom portables uh, for the ease, and it was a resource we already had available, but it also provided a separate access from the schools. So we decided we did not want to try to put our clinics in the schools themselves. You have issues of people going in and out and intermingling with students. For security aspects, it's nice to have their own separate door and access, and they're very easily uh, reached by all the employees and their dependents. One, some of the parameters we put on them, we wanted to have full primary care. We decided to go with the family nurse practitioners. Therefore, we could go ahead and take care of peds along with adult care. We decided to go to MPs because we're trying to get to more of a coaching model instead of a, just a pure treatment model when it came to the, uh, uh, the, the application of health care. And we told the folks that we contracted out with, it says that basically we wanted to have same-day access the ideal was the clinics were located so that you were never within more than 15 minutes of any of them. Now, you could always make access to them. We wanted people to call in. This is a walk-in clinic. But when they did come in, no more than a 15-minute wait. So 15 minutes from anywhere, no more than a 15-minute wait was our basic philosophy on these. Uh, we contracted with a third party. Uh, when we set them up, we used uh, University Community Health Services as our administrator, although the school board basically owned the building, owns all the equipment, we hire a management company to come in and run the clinics on our behalf. And uh, they take care of the folks and run the medical records, provide the staffing, provide the, the overall management of the process. Today we've moved that over to uh, Vanderbilt, uh, and uh, we've renamed our clinics Vanderbilt Health at MNPS. Later on, to kind of tie in, uh, some of the stuff that we did initially to drive people into the clinics, uh, it was a zero copay, full primary care, easy access. We also used our clinics to be our disease management vendor, not just for the, their patients, but actually had to kind of get it in their mind that they are now their population health manager for our entire population that they were supposed to look beyond the people that are walking in the door to figure out who should be walking in that door and try to drive them in there. Uh, disease management, uh, we did not have a separate disease management program. We integrated that with them. We started with the low-hanging fruits. We hit uh, diabetes, 
asthma COPD and cardiovascular. We tied together value-based designs. If you're a diabetic uh, and you're engaged with us, you get all your medicines and supplies at no charge. If you're asthma COPD, you get all your preferred brands and generic medications at no charge. And if you're cardiovascular, you get all your generic medications at, at no charge. Basically trying to get the people that needed attention, remove the barriers uh, to receiving care or receiving medication. Their overall health. And it was quite amazing that even with a relatively well-paid population, because I'm not talking about cafeteria workers or, or, or uh, bus monitors, I'm talking about teachers in this population. We had teachers who were not taking medicines because they could not afford it. They were spending their, med their money elsewhere, whether it's on their child meds or, or other issues. And so we took away some of those barriers. In order to give us the structure to identify and work with and monitor the people that we are trying to affect, we implemented uh, the WellScore system, uh, which John will, will basically go into more later. But basically, it's our data warehouse uh, where we are pulling down all of our medical claims, along with our dental, along with our vision, along with health risk assessment data. We've also dropped in their performance evaluations, payroll data for time and attendance, and uh, lab values. So we've made this giant repository of data that we use with, and we'll talk about some of the things that allow us to do some of the analytics and get some better levels of understanding about what we've done, what we've been able to accomplish, and basically where we need to go to. To further move forward our plans, we uh, moved to an engagement healthcare model. 2014, we, we, uh, we do not have consumer-driven. We haven't gone down that road. But we've uh, went to where we're trying to get more people to engage with us on improving their health. We have a simple copay plan. Uh, we call it the basic plan or the plus plan. The plus plan is basically if you agreed to comply with us, to work with us to improve your health, and then you basically in a benefit plan that has an 8% cost differential between that plan and the basic plan. And the cost differential isn't in premiums, it's actually in co-payments. The first requirement we put on the folks is they had to take a health risk assessment annually. The second requirement, which we finished up this year, was health risk assessment along with biometric data. had to be put in and in the future, if they are targeted for engagement with their health coach, they have to show some level of cooperation. All that is in order for them to stay in the PLUS plan and to get the better benefit package. Uh, uh, the premiums are the same between the PLUS plan and the basic plan, and we left it that way uh, and focused on the co-payments and the out-of-pockets is where we made the cost differential because if somebody decided they weren't going to comply or they stopped complying and we moved them out of the PLUS plan into the basic plan, in mid-year, they say, holy crap, I've gone to the doctor's office or I've gone to the drugstore and my co-payments have shot up. What can I do to fix this? We tell them, take that HRA, submit your biometrics, and we'll move you back. And we're able to move people. Basically, we, we move them the first of the month after they become compliant with us again. And by keeping it cost neutral on the pre premiums, we're able to do that. We made the, the different issues. The, the, the cost differentials. In the future, uh, like I say, and we'll talk about a little bit farther down and some of the things we're going to do as we move forward on the women's health and uh, expand on some of the successes that we've had. You know, that's basically where we've come. And, and you can tell there's a philosophical stance that we have in there. Uh, unlike a lot of people, we have not embraced consumer driven health care. Uh, we've taken a let me see the next slide there, John. Okay. We, we've taken this basic philosophical approach. We, we recognize that basically uh, we're trying to get away from just the fee-based medical system to do things and get basically in, in control of the health ourselves or a little bit more control in what's happening within the provider community. We are trying to get back to that old home model where you had that family doc that knew you, knew your family, and recognized you when you came in and out the door. And we were trying to basically give the primary care providers the power to better engage and manage the patient population. We are getting more holistic and 
you know, I have to remove obstacles. It's zero co-payments. It's zero weight. It's trying to get people in and get them in right away. We think, feel, believe that basically if, uh, if we can get them in earlier, we're going to decrease the overall cost of care because we're going to catch it quicker, keep it from progressing, and uh, take care of things not only from a medical cost but a lost time perspective. And then finally, we do think our, our philosophical approach is that if you can improve teacher health, you can assist in, in the educational outcomes. The reason why is basically on this next slide as we talk about the correlation that we found between teacher health and ACT. This is looking at, I mentioned earlier, the school clusters. And what we have here, as you see, is school O uh, down at the bottom. This is the correlation of our wellness indicator, which is along the x-axis. Uh, the well score is basically a health indicator that we have for the composite health of these teachers in these school clusters, which is, again, those feeder schools going up to the high school. The number in parentheses is actually the average age of the teachers in those clusters. If you can see in school zero, and on the y-axis is the ACT scores, uh, they had the lowest health, they also had the lowest performance when it came, when it came to their teachers, ACTs. On the other side, you can see uh, it looks like school C. It's a little truncated. So there's about a three-year age differential between the lowest performing school to the highest performing school. And yet the teachers are healthier, even though they're older, which is kind of the antithesis of what you're going to think about. Yeah, and so it was kind of shocking to look at it. We see where... You know, the worst performing schools actually, even though they had the younger teachers, a lot of them, had the worst wellness or the least wellness of the group or, or the more decreased. Uh, you know, which kind of gets into our next question is what's going on here? Is it sick teachers making schools bad or is it bad schools making teachers sick? And I think the answer is mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I, I think we basically have an issue of kind of a cyclical approach where they all kind of tie together. Uh, these poor performing schools are also very high stress schools and, and different issues that can be compounding on those things and the outcomes and dragging our teachers down. And once they're dragged down, how are they dealing and relating and educating from there? So it's uh, kind of an interesting thought. And where we're kind of working from at this point is actually digging in even deeper on trying to see some of the underlying issues to try to look at more of a composite issue, uh, a profile of the different schools. I've been doing some comparison between School C and School O there just on the high school level here recently and seeing some differences where uh, extremely high turnover in School O, uh, which is another thing that might be indicating the stress and the other issues that are going on there. You're talking about 27% of the staff is rotating out on an annual basis. Uh, versus, you know, maybe 13% on school C. And so you have a marked difference in there. You have a different perception between these two schools where the people in school O or the teachers in school O on their health risk assessments are telling us that they're working a lot of hours, in fact, more hours than the, than the teachers in the higher performing schools. Uh, yeah, it, a lot of different intricacies we're trying to dig down and understand a little bit more that it's kind of like the next level in our evolution on this. The, the next slide is, is a basic just to kind of show you overall what our teachers look like. Our teachers are 80% female, or 79% female to be more exact. As you can see, their age brackets uh, go across the spectrum. The next slide, we talk about how the teachers look at themselves versus how they're appraised. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see our teachers in their performance evaluation, 60% of them appraised above average which kind of blows any theories about a bell-shaped curve type thing. However, if you ask the teachers how they perform, 97% of them uh, self-assess above average, which kind of opens up for another dialogue as well. It's like, you know, uh, when you have a evaluation system that forces people to put them in gaps from best to worst, and who wants to be told that they're basically average, especially if they're out there working hard? And, and how does that impact and what does that do with the stress levels and the different issues going on? 
The next slide, we've, we've taken a look at the teacher's uh, health and the performance evaluations. We do understand that the healthier the teacher, the better their overall performance evaluation. I think it's pretty marked difference that we have between the two. One of the things that might also tie into that is that we also know that if they're healthier, they're in the classroom more. Uh, there's a 3.5 day difference between the healthier clusters of teacher to the least healthier clusters of teachers when it comes to days in the classroom on sick time and attendance. And so one of the issues that may be tying into their evaluations is the fact that they're not there as much when it comes into the sick issues and the out overall outcomes. Another thing that we're looking at is retention. Uh, a big issue uh, for us is retention. We lose 10 to 13 percent of our teachers every year. And so we're looking at what's going on across the age bands and where we're losing that. What we found out is about 50 percent of all the teachers that leave us are between the ages of 25 and 30, 35. If we can actually keep those teachers past that age of 35, there's a higher likelihood we might be keeping them for life. And so it's, uh, we've got a critical issue in our overall retention scheme because when you're backfilling over 10 percent of your jobs every year, there's just a, a never-ending uh, thirst for new talent and it's a never-ending training and bringing people back up to speed again. And we need to try to find ways to kind of slow the uh, turnover that we have. We have realized that one of the things that we can do to actually, and are doing, to actually improve our teacher retention is what we were doing already in supplying our on-site medical clinics. We found that basically if you're, on, if you're engaged with our clinics and we have like a significant portion of our active teachers are engaged with our clinics, consider, consider them the, their medical home, then it's a 6% reduction in their chance of them leaving us. And it's a six percent improvement in retention. At the same time, it's also a younger demographic, so we're starting to to grab that group that we need to. As you notice in there, we talk about MNPS primary care provider, the other primary care provider, which basically indicates other primary care providers out in the community or those no PCP or as we refer to them as being medically homeless. So overall, there seems to be a settling and engagement that helps us retain our talent if they're in primary care in general, but we do even better if they're with us. And that's the number that we're working on trying to improve. One of the thoughts on trying to improve it brings us into our Women's Health Initiative, <coughs> something we're working on right now and trying to focus to bring, bring forward next year. It, it just seems to us that if 80% of our employees are female, uh, Women's Health should be a no-brainer for us. If you're trying to... Uh, you know, attach these people back into the medical community, more specifically to yours, you should be focusing on women's health. And so we're working on some initiatives in our new relationship with Van the larger Vanderbilt uh, to tie together an overall women's health initiatives. I mean, we're talking about things like we could have a wine bar and mammography at the local uh, imaging facility and uh, different things that help us push our overall preventive care measures, push our overall medical engagement, and also try to get them more attached to us. To us. And we're putting a, a goal out there to be the gold standard in achievements, and that's what we'll be pushing forward on that. Some people have questioned why women's health, why aren't you doing anything about men? And the basic issue is, is women do care and men typically do not. Uh, you know, it's a, an issue of where we are with our overall uh, population and also where we're going to get the biggest return. Uh, we'll get more attention this way. Overall, our clinics have done well and we're trying to make them do better. And John will talk a little bit more about some of the cost impact on it pretty soon. But when we look at our active population, we are now, after about six years, providing 46 percent of our primary care. We're considered a medical home by 37 percent of our teachers. Now, we do not have our members designate primary care physicians, this is basically uh, a reviewing of the data and seeing what their patterns are uh, through some, some logic that we have. And uh, we have very few uh, medically homeless. However, the medically homeless stay to be, uh, stick around to be a, quite a concern with us. Uh, and John will talk about some of the cost impact of that group. 
bottom line, what we've been able to achieve so far this year. And since we've been doing this, it's when we put in our clinics, it was also at the same time that uh, yeah, things hit the fan when, in, in our economy. Uh, we were hit with catastrophic claims. We were hit with a recession. Our costs spiked up a little bit. We were around an 8% uh, trend those years. At the same time our revenue was down, we got in the hole. But we held the course, and we kept pushing forward. As you can see right now, if you look at that very bottom line of that graph, my five-year average trend is now 2.5%. Uh, the red line is my actual expenses, and my black line is my revenues, and the blue line or up above is basically where we would be on a 7% uh, trend, which is what we, were we have been experiencing year over year. Uh, our savings today are significant. Uh, a lot of it's driven by our approach and where we are with our clinics, some of it you may be dumb luck, but if it is, it's been consistent dumb luck over the long term. Uh, last year, we were actually even able to reduce claims by about 5.5%. It looks like this year we'll be coming back up and to around a 5.5% positive, so we'll basically be back even to where we were two years ago. But all that said, what we've been able to accomplish so far has given us enough confidence and enough revenue that we could take our money and build out our next phase. And our next phase is, is taking, getting out of our portables, getting into a bricks and mortar facility. This is one of the initial sketches. The architect drawings have improved and, and uh, we're getting closer and closer to breaking ground. But we're looking at basically making this community center of health for our teachers and our educators. What you don't see in this drawing is a top level that has meeting rooms and, and one of my favorite parts, which is a coffee bar. Because uh, we want people to be able to come in and congregate and meet, and learn whether it's professional development, personal development, or health issues, that they can go ahead and meet together and also gives us more exposure for our health care centers. On the bottom floor, we're doubling our medical uh, capabilities and doubling our exam space. We're expanding out our health care coaching and care coordinating. We're adding in mental Also, we have added in physical therapy and chiropractic, moving our operating We're tying that together with a retail pharmacy. And then on the far side, you see our exercise area, where we're going to have a full fitness area that's going to be managed by uh, exercise physiotherapists, so there will actually be trained staff in there to work with the folks. And we're going to have the machinery out front and then also have the classroom areas in the back. Because I, as I've learned more and more about this, everybody talks about it's community and it's community, community. That gives these people the bond with each other, helps them grow, and helps them move forward. At this point, let me turn it over to John. Thank you, David. Um, I'm John Harris Shapiro, President of Continuance Health Solutions. Continuance is a... Uh, data warehousing and analytics organization. Uh, we are very pleased to be David's uh, analytic partner. As David mentioned before, we maintain a very comprehensive integrated data warehouse that brings together data that is traditionally sat in separate silos um, in the health plan, the provider world, and the payer world. Uh, you heard David before mention that we have medical pharmacy claims, electronic health record data, HRA data, absenteeism data, employment data. There's just a, a vast array of data which you've seen some of the outputs involved. We describe what we do as uh, clinically intelligent analytics. Um, what we find is that traditionally people get numb around data because the people like me just generate rows and columns of data, just you know, columns and columns of numbers. Uh, and what we're doing is we're looking at the data to, to identify uh, behavior, to look for specific opportunities to improve outcomes. So the way in which MNPS and our other clients are using data, uh, MNPS is, is a really fantastic model comes down to these pillars where we are using the data to identify cases, identify opportunities for outreach, for example. We are empowering and driving outcomes with a 
profile, a patient profile that puts data at the fingertips of the providers, the care coordinators, and the coaches that they wouldn't have access to otherwise. And then finally, we have the data warehouse to do the kinds of analytics that you are seeing today uh, and can also demonstrate outcomes. So fundamentally, what we're talking about is identifying, empowering, and demonstrating. Uh, and when we're demonstrating value, uh, what you're seeing is that we're going well beyond the traditional view of benefit costs to look at productivity, business outcomes. You've seen examples of retention and turnover in sick days. So when we're doing our uh, analytics, we take a broad view of the value of health on the uh, particular business, and the, and the business of NP, MNPS, of course, is education. You've heard David talk about WellScore. Uh, WellScore sits, is an integrated data warehouse, but it also has a clinical intelligence layer where we interrogate the data to quantify the individual's health, well-being, and engagement. Uh, this is a new way to keep score that goes well beyond traditional risk profiling to look at behavior and opportunity. And um, you'll see some of that as we go through. What we have here are our uh, major subject areas and some of the uh, data points that can go in and feed data and also be available to the uh, clinicians and the coaches to uh, identify outcomes or uh, on the back end to demonstrate, uh, uh, to identify opportunities or to demonstrate outcomes. Um, and you'll get a flavor of that as we go. We'll probably be doing the demonstrate before we do the identify. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit out of order today. So we often get the question, what about HIPAA? MNPS is the employer, it's the covered entity, and we have set this up to protect MNPS from the PHI. So WellScore contains fully identified data and only aggregate reports go to MNPS and identifiable information is only channeled to the clinic staff, uh, whether they be uh, primary cl clinicians or coaches or case managers. So you can kind of tuck that away as we move forward, that HIPAA is not a barrier to doing the kinds of an analytics that you see here, whether or not you have a clinic. Uh, we have clients that use, uh, have coaching and uh, clients that have various programs. So David before mentioned the medically homeless. When we were doing an impact analysis, one of the things that popped out of the analysis was that the folks that did not have a persistent relationship with a consistent primary care provider had relatively low per member per month costs, low costs. And we were scratching our heads going, well, we don't want the bean counters to see that because they're going to fire all the primary care providers. But what we found is that's a false economy because when we look at the people that are medically homeless, we see that their, the rate of increase in their medical costs far outstrips the people that have a PCP. So what we see at the, on the top right-hand corner is that the folks that did not have a PCP, their medical costs went up 26%, where those with a PCP, their costs went down a little bit in the year that we looked at this. This suggests very strongly that the no PCP population have undiagnosed and undertreated disease. So as a result of this, you know, when we're talking about actionable data and we're talking about behavior, as a result of this, MNPS and their clinics have done an aggressive outreach program to the medically homeless to find them, bring them in, uh, introduce them to the clinics, uh, and so forth. Um, and we will look to see uh, how, if we could see people becoming uh, connected as a result of this as uh, time goes on. The next question we look at is what is the value of the clinics uh, relative to a community-based physician? And we see that when we're looking at the total cost of care, 
not just primary care, but also pharmacy, hospital use, specialist use, et cetera, we see that the differential was $372 for an adult per month versus $508 per month in the community. Some of that is age and gender because the folks using the clinic tend to be a little bit younger and are more likely to be female. We factor that demographics out using actuarial uh, age sex adjustments, and we see that the bottom line impact was nearly 3 million in 2012 and just under 2 million in 2013. What about outcomes and health status? We see that they're about the same. The WELL score is 503 versus 501 uh, for those in the community. Uh, WELL score is like your credit score, where higher is better. So it's just a tad bit better than those that are in the community. When we look for uh, the sources of the savings, we don't see it in the cost of the clinic per se, on a cost per visit type basis. What we see it is that the clinic is much better at how they use inpatient, outpatient, ER, and urgent care facilities. So we see, for example, 42% fewer outpatient visits, 60% uh, fewer urgent care visits. You know, these are uh, uh, an effect of giving people better access to primary care and also managing their health better. So there's a combination here of access and outcomes that we're seeing. Uh, the other statistic that jumped right out at us is lower use of pharmaceuticals. And nurse practitioners tend to use education as a treatment modality where it might be said that physicians tend to use the prescription pad. Um, so the, since our nurse practitioners are not on the fee-for-service treadmill, they can take the time to educate their patients and to make fundamental changes to their life. The, uh, we looked at the costs by chronic condition to see whether or not there was some bias in terms of the chronic conditions that were treated in the uh, MNPS clinics versus those treated in the community. And we see a fairly consistent pattern that the uh, clinics are better at managing uh, these chronic conditions. Now, we, as I mentioned before, there's three legs to this, identify, empower, and demonstrate. We've been looking at the demonstration. We're gonna start talking about the identify and the empowerment here. So this is all part of a larger strategy where we're transitioning from volume-based care to value-based care. So what we want to be able to do is to focus resources much more precisely that either we're talking about wellness resources or clinical resources than they've done in the past. So by dedicating our resources to those who would benefit the most, we're able to generate operational efficiencies we need fewer resources when we use them more effectively, which will drive your uh, clinical as well as your cost outcomes. Now, when we started uh, ramping up WellScore back in 2012, we were looking for impactable opportunities. One of the first things that we did was look at how WellScores varied by school, and you see uh, you've already seen the slide with the ACT scores where we took the school clusters and compared them to the ACT scores. But you can see here that when we're looking at clusters, there's a fairly broad range between 494 and 512. Um, the, uh, there's some significant variations. And then we also look at it by school and even down into the individual level. Um, so we let's focus on those organizations and those people that have a lower well score. Uh, the, we're gonna, one of the questions when we were ramping up was why does school O have a low well score and school P has a high well score? And because the well score uh, clinical intelligence, that analytic layer is transparent, we were able to generate a hotspot report that 
uh, allowed us to look for markers of, of engagement, markers of outcomes, and this is the report for the school district as a whole. So we see on this particular slice, we had 9,000 adults. Uh, the average well score was 495. And we, at the top, we looked, we see that 23% of the people use the worksite clinic as their medical home, meaning they use the MNPS clinics consistently over time. About 50% use a community-based doc, and the balance, the 28% are homeless, and those are the ones with the 26% trend. So it doesn't take a, a lot of analysis to say that if we can drive down that 28%, we're going to flatten out our medical trend. Uh, when we go through the data and look for these hot spots, the, the labeling here is uh, the style that uh, David and I have come up with over time, where we take a value and we bucket it. We assign what might be called a tier or a risk corridor. And you know, if they're OK, fine, congratulations. If they're not OK, are they in a warning level? like pre-hypertensive, or are they abnormal, which we call oh crap, and uh, if it's really high, we assign them to a oh holy crap plus category. Um, so when we go through here, we can see how this uh, varies for the population as a whole. So we have 60% of the population with a blood pressure above normal. 63% um, with a BMI above 25. 56% uh, of the population hasn't had a preventive visit. So it's very easy here to see both clinical and behavioral markers. We've also sliced and diced this report down to the cluster level, uh, down to the clinical level, so we can do some variance analysis and see where does this school have more of a problem with stress and this school has more of a problem with, uh, you know, musculoskeletal issues and so forth. So we can drill that down and uh, identify what's going on. So the, the care coordinators will reach out to various population segments and try to look to see what the root cause analyses are. So you know, is it access, is it cost barriers, is it lifestyle issues, and they're going to focus the resources in terms of what's going on there. The, when we're looking at the individual profile, which I believe we'll have time to show you in a moment, we uh, can look at some really fundamental questions that don't exist in traditional medical records or coaching systems. And you see some of the questions that get asked here in terms of whether or not individuals are taking their medications as prescribed. Um, are the patient, is the patient on the right medication? Is there overuse of emergency room, et cetera, et cetera. So we have reports that look at the population as a whole that are driving things that you've heard about in terms of the outreach to the medically homeless. And we have reports that look at the individual to empower the uh, clinicians and the coaches once they come in the door. So we want to get the right people in the door, and then when they're in the door, we want to make sure that the clinicians and coaches and case managers have the right information. So I'm going to uh, quickly toggle over to our demo, and we're going to focus in on the individual center to give you a flavor of the kinds of reports that a uh, clinician has at their fingertips when they are um, uh, getting ready to uh, work with a patient either in a primary care setting or in a, um, a coaching session. Um, Patty McCarver, who just retired, was, is the clinical or was the clinical director for the clinics, and she talks about finding pe you know, people walking in the door for sprained ankles and identifying them as being fundamentally high-risk uh, diabetics. So rather than letting things sit, she was able to get out in front of that. Fundamentally, I think this person would have collapsed and gone to the emergency room had that not been identified when she did. So this is the individual center where we can identify people that are high-risk. Um, it's a prioritized view of the world. 
what comes up is this individual profile, and it's designed to be one-stop shopping so that we can see what's happening to that person. All this information has been anonymized. Um, the WellScore risk factor summary, this is that clinical intelligence. These are the markers that drive your well scores. So we see that Megan's well score went from 422 to 448. So it's moved in the favorable direction. Now, traditional risk scores don't tell you why they're moving. Here, the clinician can see very clearly that her scores went up because she has made some improvement in her blood pressure um, and uh, various other measures here. The clinician can also see very quickly, okay, she has some abnormal biometrics, but there's no diagnosis code for cholesterol and diabetes. Is that a data gap or is that a diagnostic gap? Well, as we proceed down the report, we can see that she is on meds for, for those conditions. So, we, so we're going to assume that it's a coding gap and that she's being cared for properly. However, if we saw an abnormal value, no diagnosis code and no meds, that's somebody who has latent undiagnosed disease, a ticking time bomb, if you will. These are medication possessions, possession ratios for those who may not be familiar with it. Uh, you read this by saying that Megan is taking her diabetes and depression meds 100% of the time, but her cholesterol and hypertension meds, she's only taking 54% of the time. So that's a question that a clinician is going to, or a coach is going to need to ask to find out what the barrier is. Is it side effects? Is it cost? Um, is she in the uh, disease management programs that David mentioned earlier, in which case the cost barriers can go away? So you can see how this triggers questions, and also you can come back up here and say, well, she may be taking the meds, but she still hasn't gotten her blood pressure under control, or she still hasn't gotten her cholesterol under control, and so forth. So it tells a clinician what they need to do. We have diabetic care gaps. We can see she is connected to the uh, clinic for primary care. Uh, she does have a gap here for preventive visits. She, she hasn't had any preventive visits ever in the data. Uh, we look for avoidable hospital use, um, whether or not a stay could have been avoided through better care or through better access. Uh, from the HRA, uh, I forgot to mention before, what you're seeing here is a composite view that we've built from the electronic health record, the lab data, claims data, and the HRA. So from the HRA, we see health management behaviors, which is a category that we put tobacco use, nutrition, and physical activity. And we can see where she's at. Uh, the HRA asks about questions that revolve around well-being. This goes back to the work that David mentioned before in terms of what's going on in School O versus School um, C. Um, so we can see subjectively how they view their work environment. And this is where how many hours they report. And it's very interesting to see how they report their own job performance versus how they report the job performance of the people around them, uh, which is a very interesting indicator that we can tie back to uh, health, well-being, stress, et cetera. As we drill down just to complete the picture here, uh, we provide a medical history summary. So clinicians don't always get the full picture from the patient. Patients just don't always know what they have or they don't remember. Or, uh, there's just a lot going on. Well, because we composite the claims data with the electronic health record data, we're able to provide a full history of all the diagnosis codes that are attached to that person, all the clinicians that that person has seen, and uh, these would be names in a live data set. We look to see how the vital signs and lab results have changed over time. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of folks critique um, self-reported data, and I'm sure they have good reason. In this particular example, her self-reported data for body weight um, was the highest number was the self-reported number. So 
people don't always underreport the way we think they do. Here are the hospital stays. So she's had three hospital stays in a fairly short window. So there's some back issues going on here. And we have a complete medical reconciliation. Something else that the doctors don't always get a handle on through self-reported information in terms of what the, the patient has or doesn't have. And then finally, there is a chronology of care uh, when, when the clinicians or the case managers need to see how things are being done and when they're being done, et cetera. So with that, I would like to uh, pause um, and uh, go back to the presentation and just uh, see if there are any questions or uh, in, and open it up for discussion. JC, do you have the list of uh, uh, questions involved? Um, uh, so let's see. I, I don't see that anyone have asked any questions. Um, if, if anyone does actually have any questions, we certainly welcome you to use either the chat function um, or if you still are thinking about it, um, you can certainly email any of us um, and we can answer your question then. But does anyone have any questions from what they've just seen? I guess not. So um, we'll just go ahead and wrap this up. And I would like to thank David and John for sharing with us their story. Um, and it's a really interesting and spectacular one. We're happy to have worked with them so intimately over the past few months. Um, as a, a quick announcement to all of our attendees, this webinar uh, has been recorded and will be posted on our website. So if you know anyone who is interested in this type of content, feel free to share this uh, webinar recording with them. Um, as you can see, David and John have both presented their contact information. So if you have any follow-up questions that you're just trying to piece together, feel free to email them. Um, you may also email uh, me or anyone at IBI. You can find all of our contact information in the About Us and Contact uh, page of the IBI, IBI website. Um, and beside that, I'm sure David and John would be happy if you all downloaded their case study, which is in the research and resources section of our website. If for whatever reason you have difficulty um, viewing or downloading, please let me know and I can go ahead and send that on to you. Otherwise, we thank you all for joining us. And uh, another thank you to David and John and their great work. Um, and we hope to hear more from them soon. If uh, any of you want to share your stories, please contact me as well. We're always looking um, to tell the story of how people are forwarding our field. So um, everyone enjoy the rest of your weekend, and thank you once again for attending. Thank you.